I mean, what's that football focus doing? Last week they had Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. Hey, as a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PFL. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. We're going team by team. I would be very careful about slings. So am I going to get sued? We got legal on this? Let's send you out on the right note. Uh, PFF sucks. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs> Welcome into the PFF NFL podcast, Steve Pelizola, Sam Monson. We're live on YouTube a little bit early today on this Thursday, talking all things wide receiver rankings for the NFL draft. Wide receiver rankings. Exciting show. All right. We don't know how this is going to go because you have watched 900 receivers. Still not enough. Apparently. We're long-winded. Historically, have you looked at the previous wide receiver ranking shows? Don't we usually go for two hours? I haven't looked at the time of them, no. Okay. Well, we usually go on forever. We have a hard out here, though, because we are we are getting Bucky Brooks for an interview. You know, the guy was asking about, you know, QB evaluation problems and everything. Bucky Brooks from NFL Network. So we'll have a probably a separate video. Like a bonus show tomorrow. Like a bonus show tomorrow with Bucky. So we have a hard out here at 1120 Eastern. So we got to be uh, tight. Point. Ready? Yeah. Ready to keep it tight? Sure. NFL draft. Ready to get wide a shot receiver anyway. rankings. So um, in in the past, we've gone back and forth. Um, I don't feel good about anything beyond four. Yeah, that's what I've do. been saying. Right. It, it's it's one two. Th- I don't even feel good about four beyond that. It's one two three, and then chaos for fifteen players. Well, let's get into it. So let's start NFL draft wide receiver rankings. Appreciate everybody being here. Marvin Harrison Jr. Is he number one? Yes. Do either of us deviate from that? Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I will say. Okay, so Marvin Harrison Jr. doesn't run. Did not run at the combine. Yeah, what do you make of that? I will say the guys that he's competing with, I think, look more explosive than him. Um, Or at least the Malik neighbors, I think, looks and feels more explosive. And even Brian Thomas Jr., I would say. I mean, the guy ran in the four threes. Sure. They feel more explosive than Marvin Harrison Jr. So if there's a... When you're competing against those guys, especially neighbors, right? There's a lot of smoke around. A lot of teams have neighbors as wide receiver one. A lot of evaluators have neighbors as wide receiver one. I think there is a chance Malik Neighbors ends up coming off the board higher than Marvin Harrison Jr. In part mm. because of neighbors' explosiveness. Yeah, I, I feel a little bit about Marvin Harrison Jr. the way I did and the way people talked about Jamar Chase, which is... Jamar Chase didn't run a 4-3. Like, he's not the most explosive receiver that's come into the draft in years. He wasn't the most explosive receiver in his own draft. But he ran really, he ran way faster than we expected. Though. Jamar Chase? Yeah. But he ran like a 4, it was like a 4-4 four, four something, right? Let me check. Yeah, check. Anyway, the point being, he's not, he wasn't the most explosive receiver we've ever seen. But he was so good at everything, it didn't matter. Like, he was, he's so good at. He ran 4-3-4. Four, four. What? I see four three four. There's no way that's right. We remember we were shocked. We said it didn't feel like it on the field, and that. But my theory was that he had nine months to train for because he sat out the season. All yeah. he did was track training. This came at a pro day, right? Yeah, you want to make an adjustment for that? Yes. NFL Network has an unofficial four three eight. We uh, bunch of videos out of four three eight. I see four three four, ninety seventh percentile. Okay. With a forty one inch vert and eleven foot broad 97th and 96th percentile all of his explosive numbers are 96th percentile or higher 20 98th percentile 20 yard shuttle jamar chase who didn't feel like an incredible right. athlete on the field tested like an elite athlete all right well that kind of underlines that argument somewhat just all right cut. we'll just restart restart the show there are players of whom jamar chase is not one that had relatively pedestrian 40 times explosion times but they were so good at everything else that it didn't matter, yeah. right? Marvin Harrison Jr. to me is one of those guys where unless you're going to tell me that he runs a non-functional time, right? Like unless you're going to come out here and say the reason he didn't run is because Marvin Harrison Jr. would have gone out there and run a four six eight, right? Which I don't think anyone would argue, even the people that think Neighbors is better or Dunze is better, whoever. Uh, Brian Thomas apparently is better. Even the people that think that, I don't think would tell you right now that Marvin Harrison Jr. is like a four seven guy, right? Right. At which point, I don't really care what his number is. Like, I don't think it makes a difference if he's going to run 4-3 versus 4-5. The thing that makes him special is everything else, right? He's got – he's like Marvin Harrison Sr., only bigger. It really – it's really that simple. Like, 
he is as good at shedding contact from any from defenders as any receiver I can remember. The last guy that I think was even close was Jamar Chase, right? His ability to just get rid of contact at the line of scrimmage is ridiculous. Um, Marvin Harrison has this clear and obvious understanding of defenders' leverage, how to get away from them, not just like get to a spot and make sure the defender isn't there when he gets there during the course of the route running. He's way, way better after the catch than I expected him to be. Like I thought, you know, six foot three, 200 pound guy without kind of crazy build, you know, without a sort of an Adunze skill set of physicality. I didn't expect him to be as good after the catch as he was. Obviously has great hands, obviously tracks the ball really well in the air. Um, when I watched him last year, I didn't love his kind of like his turning circle on kind of speed cuts and that kind of thing. I thought he took a while to, I thought he like rounded some routes and like didn't stop on a dime. It was just sort of short area stuff. I didn't think it was amazing. I thought that was a lot better this year, even though he obviously had a worse quarterback situation. So I thought he's getting better. And I just think he's like a composite of neighbors and a Dunze. You put those two guys together and you end up something like Marvin Harrison. Yeah, I try, I try to break – you mentioned the yak. I try to break yak into are you a get-up-the-field speed guy? Are you speed yak? Are you get-up-the-field fast yak? Or are you shifty yak? I feel like he gets up the field just quickly, right? Just gets up the field quickly. I think all of the nuance that Marvin Harrison Jr. has yeah. to the game, body control, sideline ability, all of those things are outstanding. And, um, I mean, even after the 21 – or after one of his uh, – the 22 season, I think it was, even in my notes, I wrote down breakaway speed in my notes. I, f- I feel like you can feel that at times, right? There are a lot of – Yeah, he runs changes. away from some guys. Yeah, like a lot of his biggest plays as I was looking through them, it's like, all right, there's a busted coverage here and everything. But he is running away from the defense often enough that I don't think he was going to go out there and run a 4-5-5 or anything like that. He sort of reminds me of, like, what if you packed 40 pounds onto Devontae Smith? You know? Like, he's that... He's got that kind of level of you nuance. Love, you love Devontae Smith. Yeah. Like, I thought Devontae Smith was amazing. The only thing that scared me about him was the weight. Yeah. So, he's got all of that nuance. He's got all of that route-running savvy. He's got all of that sort of basic wide receiver ability. But he's a better physical specimen where you shouldn't the only concern we have about Devontae Smith still to be fair is you know is he a true number one can he deal with that kind of overt physical press coverage at that size do you need an A.J. Brown opposite him to take that away from him I don't think that's a question for Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, I will try to find some actual speed numbers so some of the things that I will bring to the table here um, based off of our computer vision player tracking work we were very hesitant to use this last year uh, contractually but um, this is the numbers themselves are mostly exclusive for NFL teams part of their PFF IQ package if you don't have it NFL that I know you're listening right now you better get it come get these numbers average max speeds their top five max speeds in game action and our homespun athleticism score PFF gas the gas score Um, just a, a quick note on how you would use that score. I think some of them are going to show up in the PFF draft guide. Um, The gas score, so when we come up with this athleticism score, it's not a definitive, this guy must be a better athlete than that guy. It's more of, based off what these guys were asked to do, putting a score on that. If a guy is low, it doesn't mean he's a bad athlete necessarily. He might not have, it may not have had the opportunities, but when players are high in that score, yeah, you would have, you know, a pretty good feel that they, um, that they're that they're athletic. Got and some intriguing gas nuggets in my uh, my. You got top, some gas rankings. nuggets. Okay, that's good. Uh, my favorite gas nugget, just you know, really the full propaganda here, is that Puka Nakua was 99th percentile last mm. year. So clearly, you know, it works. That's all you need to know. <laughs> that's it. That's all you need to know. Done. Um, but let me just let me just pull out um, average top five max speeds, and I will just say, listen. We, we are used to this NGS scale. This scale is slightly different. Like, it's kind of measured differently. I don't know if NGS is the true source of truth for what speeds should look like. It's just the first one that we had. So comparing this number to NGS, not necessarily, you know, not necessarily able to do that. Over the last two years, though, average top, of the top five max speeds that we've seen from Brian Thomas Jr., 21.7 miles per hour. Marvin Harrison Jr., 21.6 miles per hour. So we don't have Marvin Harrison Jr.'s 40 time. We have Brian Thomas's 40 time, which is what, high four threes? 
Marvin Harrison Jr. on the field, his five best top speeds are right in the same ballpark as Brian Thomas Jr. In this draft class, Brian Thomas Jr. is seventh. Marvin Harrison Jr. is ninth. So I have a feeling this is going to go big. This is going to go viral. We're putting out some, some numbers here to kind of say, look, it doesn't matter that Marvin Harrison Jr. didn't run on the field. He's plenty fast enough. All of the other things that he brings to the, to the table as a wide receiver, the nuance, the body control, the feel, the route running, Marvin Harrison Jr. for both of us, wide receiver one. Yep. Two. Malik Neighbors? Yes. Though I do believe it's basically a coin flip between him and Adunze. And I actually, I actually had Adunze ahead and I flipped them. But I, I have Adunze third. So we're both the same. Uh, yeah. Neighbors and Adunze. I think pretty much almost three. everybody, apparently Chris Sims breaks the consensus, but almost everybody has the top three as these three guys in some order. Harrison, yeah. Neighbors, Adunze. Um, like I said, I started off and I had Adunze ahead. And I flipped, I flipped neighbors above him, but I do think that they're right there as a coin flip. I think neighbors is more polished. He's, um, I think he's a better sort of quick moving, sudden route runner, really nice yards after catch. I think Adunze is just this like big, strong, physical, like athlete athlete without it being a pejorative not saying like he's raw and can't do anything he's just an athlete playing the game but like just this physically imposing receiver right now like the most physically imposing of those top three guys yeah I like I like neighbors a lot I think um again I mentioned the explosiveness earlier I mean I'll just I'll just cite these stats right he's he's the fastest that we have here um as far as the top the top five speeds go he, over the last two years the average of Malik neighbors uh top five speeds is a little higher than Xavier Worthy, over 22 miles an hour. Um, again, it doesn't mean he's definitely the fastest. I think he had a lot of opportunities, right? They ran a million slot fades. The Jaden Daniels analysis coincides with the Malik Neighbors and the Brian Thomas Jr. analysis. Those guys both got to run a million slot fades. And so the more opportunities you run to run, uh, opportunities to run go routes, the more opportunities you have to run fast. But Neighbors was awesome at that. I mean, I think he explodes into his routes, in and out of his routes, explodes after the catch. Um, I'm talking mostly about his athleticism because I think you feel it. And then you combine that with his toughness, man. I, you know, Think about how many times, even when we love our, our smaller receivers, we love Tank Dell, we love some of these receivers who are like jitterbugs out there, but it's tough over the middle of the field, right? Malik Neighbors is physical. I saw him being physical in a lot of the passes that I think – Cornerbacks are breaking up and, you know, getting their hands in and, and, you know, jarring the ball loose. It's not happening with neighbors over the middle of the field. So I think that's why I think that's why people are discussing him in the Marvin Harrison Jr. conversation because he can do it all. Yeah, I mean, he's got elite quickness, like his quick twitch, you know, immediate stuff. The stuff that I said I didn't love about Harrison last year and he got a lot better at this year neighbors is just off the charts of that stuff like his quick twitch instant movement is insane um really really sudden just in everything he does the thing that i like the most about him is he works back to the quarterback back to the ball exceptionally well even like at the last second or with the last step you know before the ball arrives he's always taking a step towards the ball that makes a difference at the catch point. Like, you don't have to be a physically imposing, just dominant, you know, Xavier Leggett, Drake London type of receiver. If you're willing to take an extra half step right before the ball arrives, you're changing the whole dynamic and you're getting there ahead of the defender, even if he's in good position and good coverage. Neighbors does that instinctively really well. Just every time the ball arrives, he's moving towards it. It makes such a difference in terms of whether those passes are going to be complete or not. My big concern about him all the way along has always been he lets defenders into his pads too often, right? He has this release at the line of scrimmage that is this shoulder shrug thing to try and get away from uh, press coverage. It, it might be something they're taught at LSU. Somebody's brought that up before. I don't know if that's true or not. Either way, you can't do it at the NFL, and it doesn't work that often in college either. Like, there's so many plays where he should be absolutely roasting people, and he isn't because he they get their hands on his pad, and he doesn't. He's not able to shed that contact. Th that contrast that with Marvin Harrison. Harrison always sheds that contact. Like the guy is almost never able to get his hand and stay on Marvin Harrison Jr. Neighbors, there's way too many plays in his tape where he should have gotten rid of the contact, should have cleared it, and hasn't been able to. And whether it's the 
the shoulder shrug thing or whether he simply needs to improve his hand use once he's tried that and failed. Either way, that needs to change at the NFL level. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one to see. Um, I, I mean, I was just watching a little more. I went back to watch more Brian Thomas Jr., and I kind of saw you know, the dip. I saw a little bit of that from him, too. Maybe it is. So, yeah, somebody has said is this is something that LSU teach. And, okay, cool. Either way, it needs to it needs to change at the NFL level because, number one, it doesn't work in the NFL. Number two, I think it's created some bad habits later on in the route, like later on in the stem, because, you know, you can't just, okay, shrug, you missed press, now you're running, but you still need to use your hands to make sure the guy isn't able to basically get hold of you and ride your coattails on the route, right? You need to get rid of him and separate. You need to actually break the physical connection. And I don't know if it's because he's taught at the line of scrimmage not to use your hands that he then doesn't use them through that the rest of the route, but that's what's happening at the moment too often. We'll get into a Dunze in a minute here, but first, is 2024 bringing exciting or unexpected changes to your life? Well, here's a secret weapon to help you face those challenges with more confidence. It's a great term life insurance policy. That's right, Fabric by Gerber Life makes it simple to protect your fam family's financial future so you can focus on what's ahead, knowing your family is protected if something else unexpected happens. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget, like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all online and on your schedule. You can go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. So join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash PFFNFL. That's meetfabric.com slash PFFNFL. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash PFFNFL. Policy is issued by Western Southern Life Insurance Company, not available in certain states, price subject to underwriting and health questions. Um, last year at this time, I think we also went, remember, these are, these are our rankings, you and I, our own individual rankings. Uh -huh. um, it'll differ from the PFF draft board. I think we went through, it was Renner at the time last year, uh, went through where he was in uh, wide receiver rankings. So we can go where, uh, kind of keep up with where Trevor is too in the official PFF draft board that comes with him. He's in lockstep with us as far as top, th top three. Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, two and four on the big board. Uh, respectively, and then number six on the big board is Rome Adunze, our, both of our wide receiver threes. Yeah. Discuss. Discuss. I mean, we, we mentioned him up top. Like, he's the best physically imposing receiver of those three. He's big, strong, fast, got good hands. He's, I think, better at the catch point than Malik Neighbors in terms of winning those contested catches as opposed to the catch point where Neighbors wins, which is that move towards the ball. Um, so sort of different styles at the catch point, I guess. But when it's contested, I think Odunze is a better receiver than Neighbors at the catch point. He sheds press with his hands really well. He caught 75% of his contested passes this year. Yeah, he's really good at that. We have 417 seasons of receiver seasons who went on to play in the NFL. That's number six of four out of 417. 75% of his contested catches. Yeah, he's very, very good at that. Um, I think of the three, he has the worst feel um, for sort of setting up defenders with his routes. I'm not saying he's a bad route runner, but I don't think he has the same understanding as the other two in terms of manipulating defenders with his routes and how to move them without physically moving them. You know what I mean? Just move them with your routes. And then the other note I have on him is he gets mugged by defenders more than any wide receiver I can remember watching. He's just – they're just tackling him constantly. It's amazing. Because yeah. do you – in single coverage, do you think he separates as well as some of those other guys? Or uh, is, that, is that based on he's running such a vertical route tree? Because to me, like the highlight reel with him and uh, Michael Penix Jr. is all vertical, right? Yes. It's all go balls and back shoulders. And it's – so is that just the nature of the routes? It's part of that, and I think it's part also what we said, that he doesn't have the same feel as the other two of – getting defenders out of your way without doing it physically so there's plays where marvin harrison jr or neighbors will just will manipulate the defender with their route and that's why they separate right right in addition to then the break and all that kind of stuff it sort of maximizes the separation you get i think adunze is much more sort of mechanical with his route running and doesn't have that feel for how to shift them with that because he knows he can probably win by just running the route and being better than they are yeah it, adunze he's one of those uh, him and Penix jr it's it's one of those things where they they worked together so well and i think for like when you're evaluating both players i'm thinking well michael Penix jr as a quarterback if you give him a receiver 
and work the vertical game with him, if you have someone who has that really good field, Michael Penix Jr. throws those laser beams, man, head high, away from coverage, and that's a great part of Penix Jr.'s game. And then I look at Adunze, and it's like, that's a great part of Adunze's game, right? Yeah. Is, um, the back shoulder work, and that's why I think, even bef especially before the Jets got Mike Williams at 10, I was thinking, man, if Adunze gets to 10 with the Jets, him and Aaron Rodgers as a combination would be outstanding because you could just see Rodgers immediately as a rookie just saying, hey, let's just work the vertical tree, you know, fades and back shoulders, and you have value there immediately. Not that that's the only thing that he can do. It just feels like we saw so much of that at Washington, and that's a, a big strength of Adunze's. Yeah, and I think, you know, when, you, when you're talking about Adunze, the important thing is sort of context, right? Like, is how good he is in a vacuum and then how good he is relative to Harrison and neighbors. And that those are slightly different things. Like, I think in a lot of drafts, Adunze would be the top wide receiver off the board. Yep. In this draft, he's probably going to be the third wide receiver off the board. But so we should sort of, we shouldn't lose um, sight of what he actually is when we're talking about these things. So, when you say things like, you know, does he separate that well? Well, relative to neighbors and I'm Harrison, relative yeah, to those guys, not yeah. really. Relative to like the rest of the class, fine. You know, not a, absolutely not a problem. So, like again, I think Adunze in a, in most wide receiver years would be the first wide receiver off the board. I think he's an incredible talent, and I think he's, um, you know, neighbors. You have the question of can we fix that shoulder shrug release and can we get him to use his hands better? No reason you can't, and his ceiling is incredibly high if you can do that. With Adunze, I think there's the biggest gap between what he is right now and what he could be if we improve a few bits of nuance, right? And that, so I don't, I'm not saying he has the highest ceiling, but I think he's the furthest away from his ceiling right now of the three. So even if he's worse than the other two at the moment, I think he, like, the ceiling might be the same. So I, he, he's an incredibly enticing prospect to me. Adunze ran 4.45 at the Combine. His speed numbers are a little bit lower than um, the top two guys, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, or the Brian Thomas Jr., who... At 6'3", 212 pounds. Right, so, he's bigger. Yeah. Um, but his athleticism, his, uh, his gas... The gas. ...is strong. Three years running. Big too. gas tank? Yeah, good gas. Good gas. Uh, good gas, and uh, gas is also adjusted for size at, different, at varying levels depending on the position. So there's... Uh, the size adjustment there is saying, hey, this dude's plenty good from an athletic standpoint. Um, so listen, I think it's a clear top three. Um, we, you know, when we have a Chris Sims on the show and we're, you know, he's got Mar Marvin Harrison Jr. as three and Brian Thomas Jr. as two, um, I think a lot, far more people are closer to, this is a clear top three, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, the consensus draft board, the latest version I have has them at four, five, and six. The PFF draft board has them at two, four, and six. So this is those top three, I think, across the NFL, you're gonna get some level of those three guys at the top. Usually Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah. and Malik Neighbors is one. Almost two. universal consensus. This is your one, two, three in some order, and then there's a gap to the next guys. And so, that's the way we have it. So in other words, we're just uh, puppets. Yeah. And uh puppeting. For big draft. For big draft. Yeah. Puppets for big draft. So we're plagiarizing. Well, now. so now it gets interesting. So now we're now, no longer going to become we've, puppets. We've done the show for however long we've been doing it already. And for the first, this is the first moment it becomes interesting. Now we're going to talk something different. So who is your wide receiver for? I don't know. I don't what? Wanna, I don't want to do it. Stop. Don't, don't make me answer. You have no answer to the concept of who wide receiver four is. How I've are you supposed also, to do rankings if you don't know what order they come in? I have rankings. All right. I've also said I'm not going pure model here. I'll give you some model nuggets as well. Okay. As we go. <laughs> I'll go A.D. Mitchell as wide receiver four. Ooh. I like it. I think, I think that is becoming – no, I, I think the consensus is Brian Thomas Jr. is wide receiver four. Um, oh, i got to move him by you're going to move him up? I'm going to move Brian Thomas Jr. up. Let's talk Brian Thomas Jr. Because I don't have him appearing in my list for a while. So, given that he is the consensus wide receiver four, where are you putting him? The latest thing that I wrote down, I did this last year too. I mean, I, I just move and stuff. You just move stuff yesterday. This is, it's, it's unscientific when you're just making a list of a podcast. Um, right now I have him. And the whole at, concept is unscientific. But anyway. I have him at nine. Nine. Um, and that is... I have him at 16. <laughs> oh, you're mean. You're mean. <laughs> well, um, let's talk about why, right? People are going to bring up our Zay... Oh, we were lower on Zay Flowers last year. And, and I'm I not certain we were wrong about that. We were, there's there's our kernels of truth being right and being wrong. I think part of it was 
the Zay Flowers thing, I would say we were as high on. Uh, I think we had Josh Downs and Tank Dell higher than him. Both My of order was. I had both of those guys yes, higher. Yes, same. My order was Tank Dell, Josh Downs, Zay Flowers. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think Josh Downs or Tank Dell had a worse season. Than I mean, Zay I Flowers. certainly think Tank season. Dell was better than. Yeah, they had comparable seasons. Anyway, let's talk about Brian Thomas Jr. Go ahead. Right, what he don't is. You like? He's the consensus wide receiver four. Chris Sims has him as wide receiver two ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr. The talk on Brian Thomas Jr. is all kinds of hype. I have him at 16. You have him at, what do you say, 8? 9. 9. Um, I might move him. So we're both well, way I'm lower on him, even though you appear to be losing your bottle and, uh, you know, bowing <laughs> to the people. So I just watched a lot of his deep threats, and I'm like, oh, maybe I undervalued him. To me, he's Marquez Valdez-Scantling, right? And he's Marquez Valdez-Scantling coming into the NFL in a time where I think that's slightly less valuable than it used to be, even if you got that exact player right out of the box. Um, he's got size. He's got speed. Obviously, we, we saw that. It's measured. But his entire target reel is just like exploiting gaps in zone or open deep targets against like shell coverage. It's not real. Like it's not – those don't – there aren't that many of those in the NFL. We've just seen entire – players get almost eradicated from the game because defenses are playing the types of coverage that shut those down. I don't see a ton of underneath yards after the catch ability. He's got some really bad drops. I don't think his ball skills are great, which again taps into the Marquez Valdez Scantling thing. His career drop rate, 36th percentile. Yeah, it's over 10% as a drop rate for his entire career. That's bad. Um, and I think it plays into the sort of overall uh, Ball skills, like it's it's not the same as Quentin Johnston, but it's a similar, it's a flaw, it's a it's a red flag, it's a negative in his tape. He's got every one of these guys has got you know a play somewhere where they show something that's different, right? He has an amazing yards after the catch play against Florida State, I think, where there's a, a sideline shot. Yeah, it's yeah. not even a broken tackle. It's like a sideline shot. It hits the zone and he catches it and jumps inside almost in the same movement. And takes two defenders out of the th- out of the game, and then just runs in for a touchdown. Amazing play! If there were more of those, like a lot more in his tape, I'd be more into Brian Thomas. But I just don't, I don't see what other people are seeing. I see size, speed, and vertical ability. About that's about it. Um, for the record, um, just uh, people are asking in the chat. I'll just say people. people. Brian Thomas Jr. is number four on the PFF draft board as far as receivers. Again, I said the top three. Uh, Harrison Jr., Neighbors, and Adunze, 2, 4, and 6. And then at 27 overall on the draft board is Brian Thomas Jr. So the official PFF draft board, don't yell at PFF. Hi, Trevor. Trevor. The official board has him at 27 and, fo- and wide receiver 4. We just have him lower. Um, you know, for me, data-wise, um, the data doesn't love him because I, I, I look at entire career. He was a one-year breakout player, and, essentially. And within the same offense, right? Like... People are starting to sort of say, I mean, Chris Sims, for example, right? He has neighbors number one, Brian Thomas Jr. number two, and they're both ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr., right? Now, I think there's a very fair discussion to be had about neighbors versus Harrison, right? I think that's a, I have Harrison ahead, but I think it's a very fair argument. If you think we can take him and in training camp, we can fix the shoulder shrug, we can get his hand usage better, there's a very fair argument to say that neighbors is right there with Harrison, right? In the same offense, uh, Malik Neighbors had a receiving grade last season of 93. Brian Thomas was 75. Neighbors averaged a clear yard per route run more than Thomas Jr. did. Um, is that is that cannibalizing though? Is 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 Neighbors cannibalizing the yards? You know that would be the argument. And some people have adjusted yards per route run for either number of receivers on the field or having. Uh, you know, other elite receivers there. Is that a reason why? Because Neighbors is just so good and so special. No, but that's my point. I think it's just showing that, and it's showing the difference between a truly elite receiver and a guy that's just good in a, in a good offense with a good quarterback. Like, it's a different dynamic. I'll give you a stat that works against Thomas here. Okay. One of the things I put into our, say, unstable metrics on PFF IQ is catchable targets. The meaning there being, if you're trying to isolate, are you playing with a good, good or a bad quarterback? Are you getting more opportunities with on-target throws. 97, I was surprised by this, given how much Brian Thomas Jr. goes down the field. 97th percentile on-target throws for his career, meaning the yards per route run, the, um, the receiving yards, like all of the raw stats should be higher when your quarterback's putting the ball on you. That's number 12 out of 385 in a career. 97th percentile. So Brian Thomas Jr., it's 
you would say would is benefiting from good quarterback play and those raw stats are not necessarily there for him yeah um to be clear i don't think he's bad right i just think that the hype surrounding him is kind of out of control and i think he's average so but, my, I, but i think he's the type of player that i should like though sam he is a, yeah yeah he's, yeah. A he's your new threat. will fuller yeah, I mean, he is a deep threat. I know there's a couple of these guys. I mean, he's a makes he's perfect a, sense why you're putting him up the board. <laughs> you could say he's a bigger is. You know, we're gonna we're gonna talk about Xavier Worthy and his speed. And I know you like more of Xavier Worthy's game than just the fact that he ran a four two one. Yeah. But Brian Thomas Jr. brings similar big playability there. Uh, this is going to be an unfair comp because of what he's done, and it's it's unfair because it's you know number eleven. Demarcus Robinson. I got Demarcus Robinson vibes watching Brian Thomas Jr. Only because I think Demarcus Robinson, former Chiefs, current Rams wide receiver, has had some highlight real plays in his career. But he's been madding. It's just so inconsistent. Drops and bad routes or whatever it is. And Brian Thomas Jr., I think the body catching, the drop rate leads to inconsistency. I don't think he's the crisp route runner necessarily. He's just, I think he's a deep threat. I think he's similar to your guy, Jonathan Mingo. From last year. Why wow, you had to go there, huh? Yeah. You should like him as much as you like Jonathan Mingo. I think year. he's very different than Mingo. Um, but he did remind me very much of Marquez Valdez Scantling. And to, as a reminder, Marquez Valdez Scantling last year in the Kansas City offense with Patrick Mahomes throwing him the football had 400 yards and two touchdowns, right? I don't know that that player, that style of player, is what you want in today's NFL. So. My initial, my only caveat about this is I think this receiver ca- class is absurdly deep and you can go beyond 20 players and still like them. Yeah. So I do, I like Brian Thomas Jr. in abstract terms in that 16th in my rankings is not, is not in a bad area, right? They're the two guys either side of him. I like those guys. The guys, the guy, two receivers below him I still like him as an option like those are guys that I like as players that can become useful NFL receivers but I think him being talked about as consensus wide receiver four I mean it's consensus so like who the hell am I to argue but I disagree I disagree vehemently yeah and look I, I, we're, we're at wide receiver four I think we're at the point where it becomes a flavor thing and what do you like I mean the, the top three guys I think we all agree can be quote unquote wide receiver one win at all levels of the field, win down the field, win after the catch. They can do it all. Yeah, I don't think Thomas can. So starting now, for me, wide receivers four through a million here are going to be what type of – is this a yak guy? Is this a good route runner? Is it an intermediate threat? Is it a deep threat? Brian Thomas Jr., I think a solid deep threat who's not going to be as polished all around, but there's obviously value to his game. Okay, so of the remaining people um... – wide receivers four and beyond how many of those do you think have the potential to be that wide receiver one x you know top guy because i think there's actually quite a few more you think there's more of those guys yes now they're not there now but i think there's quite a few that could become that guy <clears throat> i mean you the guy, you th- are you out guy, of those the guy that i wanted to put at wide receiver four and i do it half the balls all right jermaine burton there you go see was that that hard jermaine burton's the real one moving it now Jermaine Burton's the real wide receiver four. See? From Alabama. I knew you wanted to do it. You wanted to go there. Jermaine Burton's wide receiver four. Have the courage of your own convictions. Five. I can't I, I just I can't get over how how good his tape is. I can't get over it. I understand there's I understand there's off field. Yes. There's on field issues too. So kicking people on the field. Yes. Yeah, that's the thing. His on his off field issues are on the it's field. <laughs> onto the field. I get it. He's hitting people on the field. Like, okay, so I have Jermaine Burton in my rankings with two asterisks next to him, right? Yeah. He, he's we we've spoken to a prominent NFL coach. He says he's basically he's gonna be off a lot of people's boards, right? And I think that's probably true. There's going to be a few teams that have him on their board, and they probably like him a lot. The teams, And then most teams are just looking at that and going, this guy's a lunatic. He's off the board. Like, we're not even messing with it. So do with that what you will, right? If you want to rank Jermaine Burton, I think you have to rank him very high. But you have to also be aware that a lot of teams simply aren't going to have him in the rankings because they've looked at his off-field stuff and said, no, we're just not, we're not dealing with it, right? So I agree with you. We, we covered this before, right, when we brought up his name. And I look through my notes again, and they're all good. <laughs> like, every note I have about him is positive. He's got good speed. He can glide past players on the run, works everywhere in the offense, left or slot left, right, stops on a dime, 
explosive, quick, tight turning circle, good route running, feints, um, moves defenders with his head, all that kind of stuff. Stronger than he looks after the catch, tracks the ball well, attacks Tracking. it at the high point. Unbelievable. Like the only even and it's not even a negative, the only like slight when I started looking for things to to put in the negative column for him, maybe he's like a little bit inconsistent with sideline awareness, body control, that kind of stuff. But like, I mean, dude, we're nitpicking in a major way there. I mean, I absolutely agree with you that he's legit. I have him as wide receiver seven. Yeah, I mean, I just, I watched him and it was, I was like three plays in and just like, it popped and it just never, it never got worse for me when I was watching him. Yeah. He's actually, film-wise, one of the most excited, whatever, you get excited about watching a player. Like, I, I just had, I didn't have expectations necessarily until I just started going through his target list and was like, this is, this is unbelievable. Everything that you described, the natural athleticism. And then what I like to do is I like to watch the player and then I go to the, to the gas. Then I go to the gas score and everything. He's a two-time 99th percentile gas guy. Now we're talking. Right? Two-time 99th percentile gas. I do like – so I I watch the guy. I kind of get an idea of what I think about him. Then I'll check his – I'm still too ingrained in the old ways, you know? So I'll check his 40 time, right? And if he ran a bad 40 time or a 40 time that doesn't match what I thought I saw on the tape, then I'll check the gas. And if the gas is like, well, he's 99th percentile, I'm like, sweet, ignore the 40. Now I don't need to care anymore. Um, so, yeah, I like that, like, check process. We've yeah. Got, got so it, it, he felt like, I mean, the, the ball that he tracked against Texas early in the season, he, um, I think he's got a good first gear. And then the second gear, he just runs away from the defense, yeah. tracks it, catches it. Then you're looking. And then, and then I like to look at the stats. I try to look at the stats after the fact. And it's like, it looks like he's got good hands. 98th percentile drop rate. Four drops in his career. Four drops in his career. So a lot of times, like Larry Fitzgerald never dropped the ball. But at the end of Larry Fitzgerald's career, he was not explosive. He was just like uber possession guy. You just you knew when you threw the ball, he's going to catch it and get you know 8 to 12 yards. At worst, Burton just catches everything. As a deep threat, too. As a guy that catches the ball down the field. So body control, speed. First, second, third level explosiveness, hands. And again, not just does he catch everything there, he's adjusting to off-target throws. Yep. He's tracking, you mentioned tracking. I just I can't mention that enough. I mean, I was, I was texting people with excitement. Like, what's going on with Jermaine Burton the other night when I, was, when I was watching him? And he just, to me, feels like the fourth best receiver in the draft. I think he's a first round talent. And I have no idea where he lands. I have no idea what his NFL career looks like, it, mostly because of everything off the field. No, I agree with you. I think if you are going to rank Jermaine Burton, if you, are, if you have him on your draft board, it's got to be high. I don't, I don't see flaws. And, you know, there, as you said, there aren't that many guys in this draft that have that insane ability. I can't think – like, he has one of the best profiles of anybody I've, I've put out there in terms of my notes. I, I think – I. I applaud your state, your stance Thank of you. having him as wide receiver four. I and, love it. And he's not even like a – it's not just a pure like popping off this thing. It's not like a, a clear blue or anything. This is just me watching him on film and what he brings to the table. From a uh, on-field standpoint, I think he's awesome. Love I think it. he looks great. Love it. All right, uh, that's your wide receiver four. He's now my wide receiver four, which puts uh, A.D. Mitchell at five. You want mine? Yes. Wide receiver four, Troy Franklin from Oregon. Well, there you go. Uh, I really like Troy Franklin, and I became aware after tweeting about it and tweeting and, and the combine stuff where he ran the worst, the worst gauntlet drills I think I've ever seen in my life. I figured that would drop him six slots for you immediately. It, it made me think. It, made me, it sent me back to the tape. I'll put it that way, right? Between that and other people hating him, I went back to the He was one of a number of guys that I went back to the tape on. Dude, I still love him. He's lightning quick. He snaps off routes instantly for just easy separation. He's so fast as well. He absolutely dusts people off the line. He, he just gaps people in a straight line. Like, if you don't get your hands on him, he's gone. You better get something on him because his, his speed is so easy. Um, he's not troubled by press coverage at all. He defeats that really easily, really well. His releases are sick. Um, he's not, like amazing after the catch but he understands angles and heads to the right spot quickly which honestly is half the battle like if you understand where the space is and you're quick and just head that way 
you don't need to be like devastated. You don't need to be Zay Flowers after the catch where you can make 17 guys miss in a phone booth. Just head to where the space is and get what, what is there. Get the most you can get out of it. Another fast after the catch than rather than shifty, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he understands defenses. Like you can see, he understands zone spacing, where the gaps are, where like how to vary his route running, all that kind of stuff. Um, he can get beaten up a little bit because he's – He's not the biggest guy in the world. What is he, 176 pounds at the Combine? So we're in that Devontae Smith territory, you know, or at least we're heading in that direction. He's got 10 pounds on what Smith had. Um, But I really like him. I think he's got high-end ability, even if that gauntlet drill was disgusting. Yeah, so Troy Franklin. um, I Oh, right, and he's a model guy. He is a... High end model, high end model guy. Now he we're is, talking. He's probably my my Marvin Mims, you know, blue blue chip model, model guy. Now again, just the way I would use the model is not to. I would never make a straight ranking off the order of the model. I would never say this guy's 99th percentile, this guy's 98th, and just order them. Would never do that. You never do that. The way you would use this is in relation to the consensus because the consensus is going to get you close to um, where they should, like draft position, right? So based off draft position, so he would be at, he, I mean, in that 25 to 40 range, he would be the guy that I would look at at receiver based off the pure numbers. Now, last year at this time, I was a, the, the model of DJ Turner, the cornerback who out of Michigan who it went did. to the Bengals. And I remember why. So there's a difference between what the, you know, what the data is saying and what, um, what I'm saying, what, what what I'm watching on film, DJ Turner. I was watching the film, and I'm like, yeah, I like him. He's fine. I don't love him. Yeah, you know. And so I was joking. That's you know the data saying yes, my heart is saying no. Yeah, I've got a little bit of that with Troy Franklin, right? Because you know when I when I see the 95th percentile, 94th percentile, I'm like, I, w- I want to love this guy, and I didn't love him because wanna... of the physicality aspect, right? What you said was all right. The pure speed, getting off the line of scrimmage, as a space player, the the physicality concerns me. Um, there, last year, did it concern me with Tank Dell? And did it concern me a little bit with Zay Flowers? Yeah. And can you be productive without that? Absolutely. So I think he'll be so, productive, but the, it, can, it just concerns me a little bit at the catch point. Tank Dell is an interesting uh, comp because Tank Dell had a similar – it didn't matter for the same reasons. Um, Troy Franklin is so good at avoiding the contact uh, with his hands, defeating press coverage, you know, getting he's, – he's, uh, he's able to offset it. Uh, and Tank Dell was amazing at that as well. Also, Tank Dell is now playing in an offense where they don't expose him to that, right? Like Nico Collins is the guy that has to deal with that aggressive press coverage. Tank Dell can line up in the slot or off the line of scrimmage somewhere else. If Franklin goes to an offense like that, it's not even a question. Like if he can be the number two to an offense that already has that number one guy to take the aggressive co- – like if he can walk in to Devontae Smith's role, you know, to an offense that already has an A.J. Brown – I think it'll be amazing. Even if he has to be that number one guy, I think he's got the ability to get away from that and to avoid the physical stuff to the to the extent that I don't think it matters a huge amount. Well, I appreciate you uh, going all in on model. So I think he's a first round guy. I mean, that's like, I think he's a clear first round talent. Let me try to get you what 90th percentile really quick. Receivers will do. Um, 90th percentile receivers. Since 2018, really, in this. By the way, just a just a uh, a PSA, a reminder of how we work comps on the the PFF NFL show. Don't don't allow yourself to just hear name versus name and immediately be triggered to say that those are the same people. Listen to why they're being comped to that player. Right? The the comps come up as this guy is like this guy because of because of following right so the tank dell thing like tank dell and troy franklin are not not similar in a lot of in a lot of ways they're ve- they're very dissimilar in terms of size and all that kind of thing the specific way that troy franklin is like tank dell is in both guys are very slight but both guys are extremely good at avoiding situations where that slightness is a problem right even when they are told to go out there and defeat aggressive coverage man coverage you know guys that want to get physical and cause them problems at 160 or 170 pounds so, so when you hear comps listen to why they're being comped to that guy so just uh i'll, g- I'll give you the data here on uh, troy franklin and give, yes listen to the comps give listen me all the data that here. says he's good i'm here i for will it. troy franklin's one of three 
uh, clear 90th percentile receivers at the moment. Again, I can add more data and you know move things around a little bit as we have pro day information. But I have Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Troy Franklin. Doesn't mean I would necessarily again say for Troy Franklin's wide receiver three. I'm just telling you for his expected draft spot, which by the way is at 39. There's great value there if you're taking Troy Franklin in the 30s. 90th percentile receivers since 2018 become solid or better players. Solid or better using PFF WAR. 41% of the time. 41% of the time, what does that mean? All receivers during that time have become solid just 9% of the time, right? So you're just paring down the list here, right? 80th percentile, so instead of 41, what is 80th percentile? 30%, right? So you're just kind of like improving your hit rate, so to speak. Other 90th percentile receivers through the years include guys like Jamar Chase, C.D. Lamb, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddell, Drake London, George Pickens, Josh Downs last year. Um, also included guys like Jamison Williams, Henry Ruggs, Jackson Smith and Jigba, guys that didn't necessarily work out just yet. So obviously there's misses. All you're trying to do is improve the hit rate. So data saying Troy Franklin would be a guy. Your film watching is saying Troy Franklin might be a guy. So I'm liking that as your wide receiver four. So you had A.D. Mitchell at number five, right? Yeah, and this is where the, the model actually doesn't like him whatsoever. Really? Yeah, I like I liked his film. I think the... I have him at six. You have him at six. So let's talk A.D. Mitchell. So he's now my five. Okay. And then we'll get to your five. And um, A.D. Mitchell, another guy that I think is, you know, he's got deep threat ability. By the way, what time is our heart out? Because we're like four players in. Are we going to do a part two to this? We might have to, simply because we're nowhere. Do we just stick around and keep recording after uh, Bucky? I mean, we're live. That's going to be problematic. No, I mean, we re record Bucky. We could do it for the audio. And then yeah. record part two and drop that. But tomorrow. we could also stitch them together in the audio so there would only be one We part. could stitch them together later. Yeah, yeah maybe let's do that. we got to figure that out. Um, A.D. Mitchell, I think some of the nuance nuances in his route running, I think, you know, like head fake. He just uses his head and shoulders and to get open, which I think is yeah. fantastic. His leaping ability. I wrote down he's a patient route runner. You know, again, I think there's just a feel to route running that he has. Um, he had limited, he's another guy I don't love the catch point physicality. I know he can hang up in the air and have that incredible catch against Washington and everything. I don't love his ball skills generally. Yeah. It, it usually sticks, but it, it sort of feels like he's fighting it a lot. Like he's not, there's some guys that can just catch the ball and it's like, it's nothing. They're not thinking, it's instinctive, They're, it's, it's easy. Mitchell usually gets it, but it, it does feel like it's a challenge to him. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't, I don't love that as far as um, just general ball skills physicality. That Texas it's, it's offense, by the way, yeah. that Texas offense confuses the ever-living crap out of me. The, both receivers, and I know there's three of them in this draft, but the two main ones, they have routes that I don't know what they are. Like they are running things that don't exist in a route tree, right? Like, I don't recognize what this is. And some of it, it's like, I don't know if this is the receiver or if this is the offense. I don't know what, I don't know what I'm looking at. This is a bizarre route. That's good. They're fun. They've had so many playmakers in Texas, in yeah. Texas the last couple of years. He, re he reminded me a lot of C.D. Lamb. I don't think he's as good as C.D. Lamb, but there's a lot of sort of comparable physical traits um, and that kind of thing. Like, oh. I, I do, I feel like he's more of a project than any of the guys we talked about so far. But I do think that the project can be created, like the, the end result of the project can be pretty impressive. The challenge I have, because I, I think uh, our friend Brett Coleman also threw a CD Lamb he comp did. out there. And so he I'm going to now criticize comps. As we said, we're not allowed to do that. How dare you. The part I struggle with is I, with the CD Lamb comp, is I saw CD Lamb as a great all around, he was. high volume, do it all receiver, including yards after the catch. Yes. And A.D. Mitchell has one of the highest average depth of targets um, that we've seen since 2014 for a career. So you didn't get to see that yak ability. Right. So it's another one of those. I, I don't do know think if, it's there, though. Yeah. Is it there, or did we just not get to see that? Is, is one of those questions. Because I thought, like, I thought he can actually break tackles reasonably well. I thought he gets upfield pretty quickly after the catch. But as he said, he does have an incredibly high average depth of target and doesn't get given that many of those opportunities. So. I do think he has that ability in him, not to the C.D. Lamb level, because his was like genuinely absurd. I mean, specifically the game against Texas, he just like ran through the entire defense a couple of times, where it's like, dude, can you tackle the man? What are we doing here? Uh, he doesn't have those on his tape, but like he can. I think he's good after the catch. Yeah, we're gonna have to have this massive cliffhanger. We're gonna get through like eight receivers, and then be like, part two. We'll give you the the next twenty tomorrow. 
Uh, before we get to your wide receiver five, what was that? That was my chair. Is this, yeah. The chair is very sound effect. right now. Is that coming through in the audio? My squeaky chair? We don't have time to discuss your chair. Taking care of your health isn't always easy, Sam, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the last few years we've been, we've been drinking AG1 every single day with no, expe- no exceptions. Just one scoop, mix it in water. Once a day, every day, it makes me feel great, ready to go, ready to podcast for hours, really. It's because every, each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre- and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. Love to just drink AG1 first thing in the morning, Recommend, which is recommended for optimal nutrient absorption. You fill up your shaker, extra cold water, add the scoop of AG1, shake it up, and then I'm ready to go. From running short on time, can't mix that AG1 before heading out, just grab a travel pack, that's it. Each individual serving of AG1 that's easy to mix on the go, helping ensure I get my daily nutrients no matter what. So if there's one product I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. That's why we've partnered with them so long here on the PFF NFL podcast. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. T- try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and a free AG1, five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash PFF. That's drinkag1.com slash PFF. Go check it out right now. Your wide receiver five after Troy Franklin. My wide receiver five is my is the enigma that is Keon Coleman. Florida State wide receiver. Six foot three, 213 pounds, with a whole list of negatives and red flags. I, I, He's your wide receiver five? Yeah. You're not on an island here. No. But he's, he's a divisive, polarizing prospect. Um, there are a lot of reasons to not like Keon Coleman. His statistical profile relative to most of these other guys is not good. Uh, there there are a lot of red flags let me just say really quick i use the term for troy franklin because it's not just our data you said again the fantasy community does does a great job of looking at the receiver class statistically yes i called troy franklin a data darling right he is at the top of a lot of those graphics that you see you know going around x or whatever keon coleman's on the other end yeah of many of those it's bad now some people pointed out that if you dive if you go back to the michigan state season the year before it's better statistically now i think his tape is worse that year he just caught a couple more of these contested catches so make of that what you will um i just think i think the talent is there with keon coleman so we've talked about this before he reminded me a little bit again don't get triggered by the name of rasheed rice because last year rasheed rice was a guy who we both liked right enigma but a lot of the tape was problematic and a lot of the things you were writing down and the notes and the traits you were coming up with or the things you were noticing were bad. So, so Rasheed Rice, like 75% of my notes on him were negative, but I still liked him. I, I li- there was something about his tape that made me think Rasheed Rice is a good player. I want that guy on my team. Keon Coleman, I'm getting the same feeling for. I, a lot of my notes on him are not good, right? Which is not a good starting point. Statistically bad. Uh, pedestrian 40 time bad How's he all five? these things right all these things are not good but I there's something about him I like it and I, I I've heard a lot of people try and articulate the same way but I can't my heart says yes and my head cannot articulate why my head can't come up with the reason that I want him but let me read you some of the things I have that I think are good <laughs> rather than just tell you all the reasons I shouldn't be ranking him five I think he moves way more sharply than you expect for a guy of that size. 6'3", 213, he's got a lot more, like, suddenness about him. The 40 times stank, but he was the fastest guy in the entire combine running the gauntlet drill. Dead straight down the line, catching the ball effortlessly. I do feel like his game speed is a lot better than his time speed. Like, yeah. I think he, he does have that. I, I know the gauntlet is not a game, right? But it... It's getting you closer than just running a straight line with a stopwatch. He's a, he's a smooth, he's a smooth athlete. Yeah, and say. it's it's functional. It's it's game. It's not so it's not in game speed, but it's functional like athletic speed, right? right? Like I'm asking you to do something with a purpose, not just running in a straight line down a channel. You know what I mean? I'm asking you to run. Don't deviate from this line and catch footballs that are thrown at you. That doesn't throw him off. Like he's able to do all of that at the same time. And not lose speed, whereas some guys can run a straight line really fast. But as soon as you add the other two things on, they're like, oh, uh," you know, and it changes things, right? Um, I think he high points the ball well. He's not in the Drake London, Xavier Leggett category of like amazing, 
you know, contest to catch monster, but I think he's reasonably good at that. Uh, I did write that his tape made me dislike Jordan Travis, the quarterback at Florida State. Like, I feel I don't think he was helped by the offense at all in any way, shape, or form. I think if you watch him return punts, you actually get a better idea for what he can do with the ball in his hands than you do watching the offense function. Um, I'll give you a supporting stat on that. Uh, Keon Coleman's career, the same thing I said about Brian Thomas Jr., how he had a high catchable target rate. Keon Coleman, 19th percentile catchable target rate. So when we're looking at the stats, things like yards per route run or just raw stats being lower than some of the other players, this is a stat, catchable targets, that would say, okay, he had fewer opportunities than, say, a Brian Thomas Jr. or others in the draft class. And then one thing I noticed that he does quite well is, you know, people talk about him not being able to separate that well. Um, I think he, in zone in particular, he's got a really nice tendency that I don't see from that many people of kind of, now this might get him into trouble sometimes his quarterback's not on the same page, but he sort of takes a late step into space. You know what I mean? He kind of like, in a, if he's running a hook route between zones, he'll like hook up vaguely near the first guy he's trying to clear and then late like just before the quarterback's going to throw he'll sort of spring a step into the space right so he's not running there straight away and kind of letting the dbs key in on it he's waiting till the last second and then bouncing into that space so he's got the maximum area for the quarterback to actually target Steps so to back you up again oh nice overall separation percentage on targets 70th percentile there you go however no don't get however don't Stephen get a smith however Separation percentage in single coverage. Yeah. 11th percentile. So 70th overall. I would buy that. 11th for a yes. single coverage. So you describing him as a good zone field type of guy backed up by the numbers as well. Yeah, I would buy that. Um, That's a concern. It or, is. I do my, wonder, like his, so the, four, the 40 that I dismissed earlier, uh, I do think top speed is not necessarily amazing, certainly relative to some of these other guys. I just think he has potential to be a really, really good NFL receiver. I think he can be a better NFL receiver than he was in college. And I, Again, I acknowledge that this is a troubling process. I don't like being as high on a guy with as many negatives or as many things that concern me as I am for Keon Coleman. But I can't justify dropping him below anybody else, I don't think. Yeah, th these discussions are fun at least. I mean, these are... Um, I didn't love him on film either. I didn't think he separated well in particular. I was blown away by some of the contested catches. I think some of his, I mean, his right. highlight reel is right. sick. He's, he's got that catch. You know, Ricky Pearsall has that catch that's like, yeah. this is the greatest catch of all time. Coleman has one as good, yeah. where he jumps into like a, a deep safety, one hands it into the air, and just plucks it. And you're like, right. that is... I can't even put myself in a headspace where that's possible. So he's one of those guys where they have – there's that, right? But his – but again, going back to the numbers, his overall contested catch rate is middle of the pack. It's like – It's not even that high. It's yeah, bad this it's, year, certainly. Yeah, and his career is 52nd. Percent. And that's what I'm saying. So, like, it's bad this year. And then you go – people are like, oh, the Michigan State profile was way better. It's because he caught, like, three more of those deep contested catches. But everything that popped was a contested catch. Right? Yeah, To that's me, what I'm every saying. highlight that I saw was a contested catch. Or, like, his – my highlight reel in my head – is a contested catch, but he didn't do it at a high rate. Yeah. Um, really good hands, though. Low drop rate. There's some good there. Yep. Um, and just to be clear, from again, from like a model standpoint, he's not like a – the model's not as low on him as some of just the traditional data points. Right. It's not bad um, necessarily. I just don't know if I love – I have him out of my top ten. I just didn't love Keon Coleman. I, I have him at five, and I'm perfectly willing to state that that is a, a complete gut feel, heart overhead move. If I was doing this – completely objectively and I was like I have to justify this with you know all the information to hand I would have him lower but I just I don't know I, I maybe it's because Rasheed Rice worked out better last year than we uh than we predicted and maybe and we sort of ranked him low because of those concerns but I just feel like there's a better player in Keon Coleman than the negatives would suggest. Is and there's he, other people out there. Is the that, comp that you have for him? Do you have a, a, a style comp? No, the like Rasheed Rice is only in terms of, like, the feel was better than the the head. You know, yeah. the, than the art, than the, the feel was better than the overall cold-hearted analysis, right? The feel for Rasheed Rice as a player was better than the objective, plus or minus, you know, fair-minded, uh, analytical detail. I think that's the same with Keon Coleman. The feel is better than 
you end up if you're just analytically working through the the bit step after step um just to be a question from the chat about his game speed he is 94th in the draft when i say the draft class there's a million receivers who are technically draft eligible yeah he had good gas right um but low low top speed right low which low max tallies speed. yeah um but similar to roma dunze right who we said bigger receiver and right. not necessarily gonna but get- that i think does tally like i don't i think he has very functional game speed and if you're concerned about anything it's that he does sort of max out you know, at a, at a lower level than some oh, other guys. You're going to be so upset when Brian Thomas Jr. is better than him. It's not going to happen. It, the, the, the good Lord wouldn't do that to me. All right, my top so far, Marvin Harrison Jr., Mar- Marvin Harrison Jr. Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, Jermaine Burton yes. at four, yes. A.D. Mitchell at five, um, and then my six. You're, you're, Jermaine Burton's your six. Yep. And then mine's Roman Wilson. Oh. In Michigan. Okay. I was kind of surprised by this, too. <laughs> I was surprised by my own rankings. Yeah. All right. I mean, it probably should be Troy Franklin. I have Troy Franklin at seven. I should probably flip them. Trust the debut. Trust I was the model. Trusted. I would I would draft differently maybe than I ranked. I would trust the, I would trust the data more than my eyes. Trust the model. Team. Yeah, I would trust, trust the, the model. model more. So Troy Franklin would probably be, really be my four in okay. real life. Um, I just I loved Roman Wilson's tape. I love the route running. I love the senior bowl. I have Wilson at 15. Why do you not like him so much? Again, 15 is a good place to be. I've made this point already. I like 25 wide receivers in this draft. Why are you a hater? So ranking 15 this year is good. We, we started this show saying wide receivers 4 through 15 are basically interchangeable. So it's the same. We rank them the same, even though your number is 6 and mine is 15. It's the same ranking. I feel like there's a lot of receivers in this class who are not special after the catch guys. They're they're better before than before the catch than after. And I mean there's a lot of all different types of receivers, but Roman Wilson to me is unbelievable before the catch. Smooth route runner. Wrote down Nintendo like ninety degree cuts. It's Nintendo. like watching it's like watching Nintendo. Back when right? you only had the D pad? Yeah. You just go vroom, vroom, yeah. right? That's him. Vroom, vroom. <laughs> and he's got the toughness over the middle, lateral agility, snaps off his routes. One of the better route runners in the draft. I'm a Roman Wilson fan. The senior bowl helped. Um, I think show that in all of his one-on-ones and the way he dominated, had the one-handed catch there as well. So yeah. I'm a Roman Wilson fan. Again, you know, what's the difference between wide receivers 6 and 12 and 15? Not much. It's what we said. So it's I all, just picked one. I mean, at this point, it's all meaningless. We don't need – we can wrap the whole show up in a couple minutes. It's just all tears. Run through. They're all, these guys are all the same from now on. It's all tears. Uh, and then okay. I, have, I have Troy Franklin seven, since we've already talked about him. I have Roman Wilson, right. Troy Franklin. Maybe I'll end up flipping them. I don't know. But who's your seven? Go through your list again, and then give us your seven. So same top three. Marvin Harrison, Jr., number one. Malik Neighbors, number two. Roman Dunze from Washington, number three. Troy Franklin from Oregon, number four. Keon Coleman from Florida State, number five. Adonai Mitchell from Texas, number six. You got him six, sorry. Yeah. Jermaine Burton from Alabama, number seven. Uh, are we at eight? Yeah so, yeah, so now go to your eight. Okay, so my number eight is Xavier Leggett from South Carolina. Oh, wow. I didn't have you heard him talk, him. by the way? What? Have you heard him talk? No, I have not. He has a phenomenal southern accent. Nice. The kind of accent that doesn't seem to belong in a guy that looks I like jack him. jack him up to eight? And I just, it's just an interesting nugget uh, since we're doing these things. Xavier Leggett, South Carolina. Okay, apparently only six foot one, but 227 pounds. The dude is a monster, and he's fast. At 227 pounds, to be able to move that fast in a straight line is crazy. Uh, he gallops when he's in the open space. Just like the speed that he has at that is ridiculous. He's Now, remember, if the first thing you're telling me about a guy is he's a contested catch monster, red flag. This is now the third thing I'm telling Fourth, if you count the accent. This is now the third or fourth thing I'm telling you about him. He is a great contested catch receiver. I don't think he's as good as Drake London, but Drake London was the best I can remember at that. He might be the second best. Like, he elevates exceptionally well. He high points every pass. He beats the cornerback to it. He did it all the way through his tape. He did it uh, at the senior bowl, right? The Where was he? Was it the senior? No, the combine. You just watch him at the combine. Like, his ability, this is against air, so it's very different. But, like, watch him. He high pointed the ball better than anybody else in those drills. Good right? catch radius, he high just points, has, attacks the ball. First yeah, note for me. He go exactly. He yeah. goes at first note. You see, not good. This is the first thing I noticed. It's not the, it's not the summation of his game. It's the first <laughs> thing that I noticed. Though. He's got like legit top end speed. He can run away from people. So he he was a guy that I had ranked reasonably low when I did my first run, and then started moving him up and up as I redid it, because I came to the conclusion that. So I've got some negatives as well, but I came to the conclusion that the stuff he's good at 
is way more important. Like he's big, fast, and can moss people, right? Even if he never gets any more nuance than that, that's pretty damn effective. That's what DK Metcalf can do, right? So there's, uh, there's reasons to think he's really good, even if he can't do things. Now, negatives, it's not a whole lot of route running on his tape. Like it's a fairly rudimentary right. role that he had there in college. Number two, throttling down and turning in a tight space can be a problem which, you know, is a lot of body to slow down when you're 227 pounds. So throwing on the anchors and getting that stopped and turned around can be an issue. But again, I just think the, the things that his, his selling point is too, too enticing to drop him. Yeah, we're in, the, we're in the styles portion of the receiver group. Yeah. Right? Because you mentioned DK Metcalf, and that's, again, not, not as a direct comparison, and he equals DK Metcalf. Right. But DK Metcalf, who at the time we had as wide receiver one on our boards and on our film watching that year, we said, look, this guy is such an incredible size, speed, specimen. And then the Seahawks used him yes. properly, right? You're going to run some goes, posts, and slants. Everything is either speed or big body driven. Yeah. Um, Leggett's not the same. I don't think he's the same type of player. But, yeah, the, the contested catch ball skills are great. The after the catch speed, I think, is outstanding, right? Catch and run, and he creates big plays. Anything else nuanced as a receiver, I think, is questionable. Yeah, so guys like this might need to be used in a specific way, but they can be as imposing and as dominant and as productive as any receiver in the NFL. But, like, it's Marvin Harrison Jr., you can take and put him in any role in any offense in the NFL, and it's going to work, and he's going to look amazing, right? Xavier Leggett, you can't really do that. You probably need to do a specific role. But if you do, again, like DK Metcalf, he could put up, you know, 1,300 yards and 10 touchdowns. Like, you can have him as one of the most productive receivers in the NFL. You just can't necessarily ask him to do everything that you would ask some other receivers to do. So that's how I would describe those guys. Um, so, yeah, Leggett, I, I thought watching him, I, again, anything – Route running, I thought he fell to the I – mean, I wrote that he falls to the ground a lot. That was one of my notes on Coleman, one of my neg- one of my many negatives. You, because I, I think I said this to you about Leggett, and you were like, I'm writing this down a lot this year. It did seem to be a trend this year for receivers. A lot of these guys are on the ground a lot. Yeah, and so I think speed, size, and physicality with Leggett is all good. The, the knock on him that I hinted at on the other show from a data perspective um, – Again, there's a lot of people in the fantasy community. They talk about breakout age and different things. Yeah. He literally had zero good seasons. Wasn't on anybody's radar into, until 2023, his fifth year of college. That does not historically play very well. A fifth-year breakout receiver. PFF grades back that up. He had it in 2019 a 46, then a 59, a 58, a 56, and then an 82.5, including an 86.9 receiving grade. So the, the, the grade in 2023 was good. And I know that you know, some people will say, well, players develop, and that's what he is. And right. you're evaluating his 2023, but I think historically there's, there's signal in the body of work. I mean, he has, he has a little under 1,700 career receiving yards, and 1,255 of them came last season. Right. That's just, at the very minimum, that needs an explanation of some description, particularly yeah. for a guy who, you know, okay, Apparently only 6'1". But 6'1", 227, like, there's an obvious, like, hey, you see this, like, giant dude walking around that can apparently run a 4'3"? Like, you know what I mean? Like, the things, the reasons for, like, putting him on the field are fairly obvious. And yet, where was the, where was he? What happened, right? So, again, I, I worry about the, the all-around player, but in a role where he's put into space where he can catch and get upfield and they, you know, chuck it downfield to him every now and then. I think, you know, that, that kind of makes sense. I have him... Outside my top 10, you have him at eight, I believe. Yes. Um, eight uh, At number eight for me, I'm going Lad McConkey. Okay. I'm bringing Lad in here now. He's I like Lad McConkey, and yet he was the guy that I that he kept falling a little bit. Him? I didn't cut him. Well, depends. Cut him from my top 10, yes. Cut him overall, no. Cut the legs right out from under him. Lad, I, I just think, remember you described Calvin Austin versus... Um, Marcus Jones. Marcus Jones. As watching football on fast forward. Yeah. To me, that's watching Ladd McConkey play football. Because he's he's fast and quick. And you don't always get that. I was I was blown away by him as well, as far as um, just how explosive he looked in SEC football. And so I think that 
that for me, and I think he can win on the outside. I don't think he's just a slot receiver. Yep. I want him as an outside vertical route tree type of threat. I think he can win down the field, get past DBs, but I think most importantly, the curls and hitches and everything, he just gets in and out of his breaks, I think, so quickly. Yeah, snaps I off his routes. Snaps him. Yeah, I am a, I'm a Lad McConkey fan. So no, I, I like him a lot. Um, he is a he's a route running technician, but it's with that speed and instant snapping off of his brakes, like brakes really sharply. He has some of the like you remember that the blaze outs that Julio Jones like the Julio Jones route, right? Where it's like you run, you sort of fake inside and then break hard all the way to the outside yeah, yeah. laterally, right? I think that they call that a blaze out. Uh, Julio Jones, like there's all these videos you'll find of Julio Jones sending a cornerback to like the middle of the field. <laughs> the corner's sprinting in right. the opposite direction. And yeah. Julio Jones there on the sideline, like completely unmarked because the because the routers just sent him. Uh McConkey has the sickest blade outs I think I've ever seen anybody run. He just destroys people on that route. It's amazing to watch. Um I, I don't think he's dynamic after the catch, but he's got enough speed that if there's space there he can do damage, you know right. what I mean? Uh, I do think that the only thing, the thing that concerned me about McConkey, I think you're right, he can win on the outside, but he definitely struggles physically if a guy touches him. He's got a little bit of that Andy Isabella about him where he can just get bumped way off his pattern. Like if you're, if he's not able to avoid the contact, the contact is going to be a problem for him. So that's my big area of concern for McConkey. Am I going to get burnt again with an Andy Isabella? I mean, Andy Isabella is one of the reasons why, you know, like a Troy, when Troy Franklin's not winning at the catch point and just like the slightest nudge is knocking him off his route, I'm like, oh, no, we can't have that. Yeah. So I, I get that as a... It, to as me, a it's more, concern. to me, it's less concerning at the catch point than it is during the route. Yes. Like if you can't avoid a guy bumping you completely off your pattern. Because people, I mean, even with illegal contact rules, people don't realize until like when you're watching close up how physical just running a go route or just how or yeah how consistent like, contact yeah. is from defenders throughout right. the course of your route in the NFL like this people sometimes have this weird theoretical idea of like oh you're not allowed any contact you're in routes like dude watch what's happening yeah. it's pure contact all the time you just need to be able to avoid that or get or, or get through it all right we got about seven minutes here I think we can at least get through our top tens. ten yeah and if there's enough groundswell for people to have us discuss other receivers and our sleepers and we have to do more like there's too many good guys we'll to wrap two. it up at we'll 10 have a part two um who's your number nine receiver uh my number nine is Devontae walker tez walker um he's a guy i feel that is getting more undue hate than anybody else in this draft right now because he had a stinking senior bowl where he dropped everything and and people look at that and they go oh he's just not good enough it's not good enough for this uh i feel like i mean that, that's not like he always dropped the ball. That was a weird week. Okay, it was a bad time to have that week, but, you know, your Mr. Drops don't matter. Who cares? He's not going to do that throughout his NFL career. That's not who he is. Um, he's really good. He's a physically impressive receiver. He's almost 6'2", 190 pounds. Uh, my favorite thing about him, right? This is a slightly strange thing, but he is always correct at the catch point, right? And by that, I mean he makes the right decision on whether to wait for the ball, you know, let it drop into the bucket because he's got the space to do it, or go and attack it because the DB's close enough that you can't wait for it to drop into a bucket. He'll make a play on it. There's so many guys that don't have a feel for that, and they're, they're, they leave so many plays on the table because they're trying to – they think they have the gap. They're waiting for it to drop into a bucket. It's a well-thrown pass. The DB's just there, yeah. And the DB just make, breaks it up. And you're like, dude, you never gave yourself a chance because you thought you could let it drop there. Or they do the opposite, and they go and attack every ball. And you're like, if you just let it drop into your hands, you had 30 more yards to run in for a touchdown. Like, you don't have to attack everyone. You just have to attack the ones where the DB makes it necessary. Walker is always making the right decision on that. Like, every single time. It's amazing. I can't think of too many other receivers that do that. Uh, a lot of guys it just feels like random or they do one or the other all the time. He's always correct at that, and he's good at it. He's good at the catch point. Um, I don't think he's the most nuanced route runner in the world, but he's fine, and he's the physical tools play. Like, I like him. I think he's being slept on quite a lot. I mean, I feel like we're there's a lot of these guys now. If we're going to criticize Brian Thomas Jr., who, again, I think it would be a can be a good vertical threat. I mean, that's Te I mean, Tez is a good vertical threat. I think he's way more versatile, though. Like, I yeah. think he works a lot better underneath. And by the way, the the difference between the drops, right? Like, Tez Walker had a 
ton of drops concentrated in a couple of days of practice. Brian Thomas Jr. has struggled to catch the ball throughout his career. It's slightly different. My point being, Tez Walker's drop rate throughout his career has not been bad. Uh, his drop rate, 40th percentile, a uh, little over 8%. So it's not, it's not great. But it's better than Thomas's. Yes, I believe it's better than Thomas. My point being, I think yeah, that the that one week of acute drops in like in rapid succession in a, in a in an all star setting has people way lower on him than they should be. You know, when he was at what Kent State, right? I double check that. But when he was at Kent State, I believe it was Correct. against Georgia in yes. 2022. You're watching. Like, there's a reason why he transferred to UNC at the end of the season, right? Um, in part for the personal reasons and everything that was well documented. But um, he was running away from the 2022 Georgia defense. He looked explosive there. And yeah. you know, when you're watching a smaller school guy, that's one of the things you're looking for. So Right. Can you do it against good competition? Yeah. He's done it against all competition. He was like, inconsistent last year at UNC. And, you know, he got there, he started later, and there was a lot of stuff going on. He was inconsistent. He had an inconsistent senior ball. Um, that's kind of marred his career. Inconsistency. I mean, he missed production. a chunk of the season. Which he didn't did. help. But um, I, think he's a, I think he's a vertical, another one of those vertical threats, good size, Vertical threat. I'm yeah. not as high on him as you are, maybe underneath on underneath stuff. But um, so he's your nine. Yes. I'm going Brian Thomas Jr. as my nine. I put him up there. You did. Yeah. Again, okay. mo- model doesn't like him whatsoever. No. I'm saying I. Should think, you again? I'm putting have, him. Have the courage of your convictions, and by your convictions, I mean your model. The, yeah, the, I wouldn't draft him. The model. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's how the model works. Oh, somebody put that as a social graphic. Stop it. That's how the Ryan model Thomas works. Ryan Thomas Jr., I, I wouldn't draft him, Steve. There's Palazzo. only about 50 people on my draft board. So it's fine. I, look, we don't need context. We just put it out there as, that, dra- as that's how we go viral. The model, the model usually has about 16 you think or 17. You, you got think, 16 or 17 non-quarterbacks in the first round. You have a nine, eight or nine people in the second and third round. And that's it. You think there's context out there with Chris Sims' graphic of top five wide receivers? No. You just put out the graphic and you deal with the consequences. Ryan Thomas Jr. off my I wouldn't board. draft him. Steve Palazzolo. Wouldn't that's what we do. Thanks. Yeah. I already got everybody calling me Big Goofy. And then and just a link to the show. Fine. <laughs> Who's your 10? My 10 is Xavier Worthy, the Texas ah, receiver. This will good. Nice. So we get two minutes here and we'll just talk about Xavier Worthy. Then we'll cut it and we'll come back here and have a part two. Yes. Maybe on Monday. We have to do mock draft Monday. I know. I don't know. We'll no, do we'll just do it after the Bucky. All right, fine. So it's a very short amount of time. Apparently, we're talking to Bucky, so we can just keep going. Uh, so push a radio hit. I back. think he's a lot more nuanced than people are giving him credit for. I actually think he's just solid at everything. Like he's stronger than he looks, and obviously that's a big concern given that he weighed in 165 when he ran his 421. Um, like he attacks weak shoulders and really goes for yard. Like doesn't doesn't break the tackle most of the time but like he's he's not he's not just dead on contact you know remember the way Isaac Bruce was at the end of his career where he would like dance around till there was no more space and then he would literally just fall to the floor rather than take a hit right Worthy finds the soft shoulder and tries to get two more yards out of it um I think he's got like his speed is obvious he's got a six second gear when the ball's in the air he'll run after it and it's virtually impossible to overthrow the guy um but I think his route running is good I, th- I felt uh, he felt a little bit like Jordan Addison to me, where he's just good at everything, except unlike Addison, he's got blazing speed. So you th- you- Jordan Addison was your top wide receiver last year. He was. You like Worthy that much? No, that's why he's number 10. You just 10. equated him. I didn't. You just equated him. I said him. he's a little, a little bit like was the words that preceded Jordan Addison. No, I love, I love Xavier Worthy and the speed. I mean, he is just such a natural runner. I'm just... I mean, he ran four two one. But this isn't doesn't matter how he runs, but everything about it, you know. Again, with runners, I think he's got first and second gear speed. Gets on you quick and then runs away from you. Um, will lay out for the ball. He's difficult to overthrow. He was my initial Mike Wallace comp because I think I think he's going to get behind the defense and I think he'll have struggle. You know, struggle catching the ball sometimes, body catching and everything. He'll track it and remember Mike. I think Mike Wallace any bit of contact if he wasn't clean behind the defense, it was it wasn't great. I think Worthy has some elements of that, and he's not really a wiggle after the catch guy, just super fast after the catch. He's to me, he's a mostly a pure speed receiver, vertical route tree. Throw him for me on the Mike Wallace, uh, Will Fuller, you know, uh, continuum there, and um, I want that guy on my team. Yeah, I think he's a little bit more nuanced than that. I think he's got a bit more about his game than that. I don't necessarily can have concerns about his drops. Um, I mean, he's better than Tez Walker, who's better than Brian Thomas Jr. I think his drops are 
I don't think he has that many. I don't think he struggles catching the ball. Uh, yeah, I, I like him. I, I think he's a good receiver. I think he's going to be uh, effective right away. I don't think he's going to be just a deep threat because he's like, obviously he just broke John Ross's record. So everyone's going to be focusing on John Ross and go, wow, why is he not John Ross? Well, number one, I think like he can do more things than John Ross. And number two, John Ross apparently couldn't do much at all at this level. So I don't, I just don't think you should look at any fast receiver and go, why he's, why is he going to be anything other than the next John Ross? Like yeah. he's, he's good. He can do a lot of things. All right. So we both have our top tens. I'm going to run through mine really quick. Okay. And we're going to take a pause here. I don't think we're, are we going to go back live again. I might as well. If we'll we're figure recording. it out. Um, but we're going to have, we have to, we have to stop to go interview Bucky Brooks. Yep. Should we just make that a part of the show? No, we can't do that. No, stop. Marvin stop. Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, Jermaine Burton is my four. A.D. Yeah. Mitchell at five. Roman Wilson, six. Troy Franklin, seven. Lad McConkey, eight. Brian Thomas Jr., nine. Xavier Worthy, ten. And we'll be back with more uh, post-top ten here. Give your top ten and we'll sign off. Marvin Harrison Jr., Ohio State. Malik Neighbors, LSU. Roma Dunze, Washington. Troy Franklin, Oregon. Keon Coleman, Florida State. Adonai Mitchell, Texas. Jermaine Burton, Alabama. Xavier Leggett, South Carolina. Devontae Walker, Tez Walker, North Carolina. Xavier Worthy from Texas. One through ten. Good job putting schools to their names. All right, so we're going to uh, take a break here. We might come back live, but either way, there will be a part two with our receivers. You'll get the rest of our top 15 and some sleepers and sleepers. other receivers. Let's go to keep an eye on. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you again soon with more wide receiver rankings.